Jesus, we just come before you today and we worship you. We worship you for your holiness and your might. God, we just worship who you are, all that you are. I just pray that as we go about our day, that you would just remind us that you love us so much that you came before us. You made a way for us. And we never have to go through this life alone. I just pray that you would just set our hearts on fire for you today and every day. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. What's up, Simple Church? My name's Aaron DeLong. I'm the lead pastor here. I want to thank you for tuning in to episode four of our Dangerous Prayer series. Uh, we are in this series. We do a series every August and take a time to focus on prayer that we do in tandem with our 21 days of prayer, which just wrapped up yesterday. Man, I hope that that helped you set the pace, uh, get back into a rhythm uh, for the rest of this year, and that you continue praying, that you make that a focus every day, not just during our 21 days of prayer. But we've been in this series called Dangerous Prayers because following Jesus was never meant to be safe, and these prayers are prayers that connect us to the adventure that awaits us 
Uh, they're, they're prayers that, that will help us continue on our spiritual journey because a lot of us, man, we said yes to Jesus. We got baptized and we started coming to church. Maybe we joined a team, but that's kind of where things ended. And I believe that God has more for us. And so these prayers of make me bold, speak to me, or, and Lord, break my heart, like these are prayers I hope that become part of your regular prayer cycles, like things that you pray on a regular basis that because they're intended to shake the comfort from your life, to, uh, to challenge you spiritually and your spiritual walk and lead you, like I said, to adventuring with Jesus because I don't think we need to have boring Christianity. In fact, I don't think Christianity was ever meant to be something that we check off on a list. I think it was supposed to be an adventure. I think that every day there are possibilities that await us. And if we pray these kind of prayers, dangerous prayers, we'll begin to experience those adventures on a regular basis and tell stories that would just blow people's minds. So today let's jump into it. We've got one last dangerous prayer uh, that we are going to pray. And this prayer comes from David. David, yes, the same guy who killed Goliath, David, yes, King David, that David, David who it was said about him that he was a man after God's own heart. That David in Psalm 139 writes a dangerous prayer. And let me just give you the context of this prayer that he writes. His enemies were surrounding him and attacking him uh, verbally, not just physically, but verbally attacking him because they were questioning the motives of his heart and saying that his motivation for doing some things we're all wrong and off base. And instead of David ha- offering a defensive response and being angry about it, instead of that, he went to God and he prayed a dangerous prayer. Let's take a look at what it is. He said this in Psalm 139, 23 through 24. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any off- offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Holy cow. So dangerous prayer number four is ultimately search me, God. Search me. Now, here's what I'm going to do today. This prayer is really powerful, and I'm going to break it down into four parts that we can all easily understand it, apply it to our lives. And my hope is that as I help you understand it, I'm equipping you, which is my job as a pastor, is equipping you uh, so that this becomes a regular prayer that you pray. So the first thing that David prays, and we see in Psalm 139, is he says, search my heart. Let's go back to the verse. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Now, you say, Aaron, why would I ask God to search my heart? Doesn't God already know my heart? Doesn't he already know what's in there? And besides, some of us are pushing back a little bit. Like, we say, well, why search our hearts? I mean, I have a good heart. I'm a good person, right? Or maybe you're saying that about someone else. Someone else, they, they, do you know the things that they do? Do you know the ways that they give to charity? Do you know the kind of person they are? They've got a good heart. How many of you, by the way, that are, are tuning in today that are here in the online campus or maybe you're there at a watch party and, uh, and you've joined in or maybe, maybe you're just by yourself, but you would say, Aaron, this is me. I'm a good person. Somewhere in the comment section, why don't you let us know? Just put it, put it in one of those raised hands and say, I'm a good person. I have a good heart. So go ahead and share that in the comment section right now. That's me. I've got a good heart. Do it. A little game show music playing here. I'm not mad at it. Now, if you are somebody that says that you have a good heart, <clears throat> guess what? That's the wrong answer. It's just not true. In fact, Jeremiah 17 says this about the condition of the human heart, is that the human heart is the most deceitful of all things. Like of anything else out there, our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Not just a little bit wicked, but desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Jeremiah is saying, hey, our hearts are not good. There is nothing about them apart from Christ. Our hearts are not good. We have a tendency to deceive others and, most of all, ourselves. So let me just go back to you right right quick, get you engaged again. Come on, get your hand raised and skills ready. How many of you would say that you are a liar or that you have a tendency to lie? Go ahead, raise your hand up. Just be honest. Raise it up in the comments. If you're sitting at a watch party, go ahead and shoot your hand up. Do that now. 
Now, if you're sitting in a group of people and they're listening to this and they haven't raised their hands, go ahead and look at them and just point at them and call them liar, liar, pants on fire. Go ahead and just do that because they're absolutely lying. Every single one of us lie. And we lie for different reasons, mainly because we're afraid of something. I lied this week. In fact, I had to apologize to my wife and my daughter over something that I lied about. They, they asked me, did you get that phone call? And I panicked for whatever reason I panicked and I said, no, I didn't get that phone call. I did get that phone call. I ignored that phone call, got a voicemail from that phone call that I deleted to cover up the very fact that I got that phone call. I did. I absolutely did. But when confronted about it or asked about it, I lied. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and convicted me. And I, I went to my wife and I went to my daughter and I said, I'm really sorry. I actually did get that call. I don't even know why I'm lying about it, but I chose to lie about it. They said, that's okay. And I was like, no, it's not okay. It's not okay that I lied to you. But we do this, right? You say, man, I don't know if I can follow a pastor who lies. Listen, I don't know if if I can have audience members who lie. Just kidding. We all lie. I lie, you lie, we lie. We lie a lot. More commonly, though, we lie to ourselves than we do to others. We say, well, I don't really eat that much. Like, I don't understand why I have weight problems. And then you go on and you do a line of Oreos, right? Like, you were just, we just lied to ourselves and say, well, I'm only going to have one drink, but then you order like this oversized drink, like a margarita in a fishbowl kind of thing, like, right? Or, or you say, well, I'm not prideful. And then you go on ranting about how amazing you are and how much better you are than people. Or you say, well, I'm in control of the drugs, but you don't realize that you have orchestrated your entire life and pointed everything that you do towards your next high. You're in control, but you're not. You say, well, I don't lust. I just enjoy other people's physiques, and, 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 but you don't realize you're having marital issues in the bedroom because you watch too much porn, or I'm not materialistic, and yet you refuse to purchase anything that's used or isn't designer label made, or everything has to be nice. You say, well, I'm not a gossip, but, but you tell everyone's business in the form of offering up a prayer request. We just need to be praying for John because he's just going through this marriage situation. Like you just, you're just, you're a gossip. We deceive ourselves. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things. So that's why this is a dangerous prayer. Asking God to search our heart because what's going to happen is, is God is going to show you some impure things in your heart. He's going to show you some stuff, man. And it's not because God is cruel. It's because God wants to make you more like Jesus. In fact, the Bible says that it is the goodness of God. It's his goodness. It's how good he is that leads us to repentance. That he doesn't punish us, hit you with a lightning bolt right there on the spot. Kill you now because you made a mistake, because you told a lie, or because of your deceitfulness towards yourself. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, meaning changing our mind, changing our way systematically, reorganizing and restructuring our lives so that we can follow after him better. And doing this, praying this prayer, and having God reveal this stuff in your heart, searching it, is what will bring you closer to God. And then we see that David prayed this. David not only prayed, God, search my heart, but he also prayed, reveal my fears. Reveal my fears. Go back to the verse. He says, test me and know my anxious thoughts. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. What is anxiety? Anxiety is anything you're worried about or, or I would say the things that you are fearful over. Now, I'm not talking about your phobias, like you're afraid of the, uh, of the duty parasites, you know, in public bathrooms or I'm not talking about like, you know, you're afraid of spiders or you're, uh, you're afraid to eat certain things or whatever those, I'm not talking about those kind of things. I'm not talking about your phobias. I'm talking about things that you're afraid of. Years ago when my kids are little, they're all grown now, 17 and 18 years old. Uh, they're all, when they were little, I would send them like, hey, it's time to go to bed. I need you to go get your pajamas on or go up and stairs and take a shower or go brush your teeth. And they, they would hesitate to go and they wouldn't go. I'm like, what are you? I got so frustrated. I was like, what are you afraid of? To my son, and he said, you, Dad. See, over, over there...
lifetime, I have taken great joy in sneaking into places after I've sent them to go to the bathroom or sent them to brush their teeth or go get their pajamas on, to sneak and position myself in places where uh, I'm hiding and I get to jump out and scare them. So it's not like they were ever scared of the boogeyman upstairs or scared of the dark. They were scared that when they went and were obedient that I was going to find myself in a place uh, positioned so that I could jump out and scare them because I did so much. Uh, hilarious to me, uh, but, but, but that's the situation. I'm not talking about those kind of fears. What I'm talking about is what are you genuinely worried about? What kind of fears do you have in your life that keep you from acting from a position of faith? Like, are you afraid of losing your job? Are you afraid about, about being single for too long and not getting married by a certain age? Are you afraid that you're in a marriage that is stuck or has some turmoil and it doesn't seem to be getting better and you're afraid it's going to be stuck like that forever? Are, are you afraid of the future? Are you afraid of the unknowingness and, and like the unknown that comes along with a future, right? Like it's out of your control and you can't see it, you can't know it, so that freaks you out. Are you afraid of, uh, are you afraid of failing? Are you afraid of making the decision that is wrong or stepping out there and trying something new and therefore you fail and you make a mistake and are you afraid of that? You know, there's some people that are even listening today, you're afraid of success because success adds a whole lot of pressure to your life that isn't there if nobody knows that you can do something great because once you succeed, there's the pressure of succeeding again or remaining successful. Some people fear success. Sometimes it's just loss that we fear. We fear loss of a person, a relationship. We fear loss of something. So we're, we're very protective of it. And fear is what drives our behavior. And, and why pray this? Why pray this prayer of, of, Lord, test me and know my anxious thoughts? Understand, show me the stuff that is making me fearful. Well, I would say because what we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. What we fear the most, that thing that you are afraid of the most, that one thing that grips you, keeps you from acting in faith, is where we trust God the least. So if you're here today and you're, and you're listening and you're scared your marriage isn't going to work out, it's because you're not trusting God with your marriage. If you're scared you're not going to be able to, tr- to pay your bills, it's because you're scared that God isn't going to provide. If you're scared for the safety of your kids, it's because you're not trusting your kids to God. What we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. That's why we need to pray. God, search my heart. Reveal my fears. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. You know, this is a prayer that I have prayed for years. This is, I, I've been praying it this week leading up to this message, but also this is a prayer that I've known about and I've prayed. I've loved this passage from David. And I've prayed this repeatedly and I've discovered through praying this, what God has revealed to me, do you know what my greatest fear is? My greatest fear is worthlessness, is, is, is being of no use, is being considered worthless, of no value to anybody. And so I have this strong desire within me to feel valuable to people. So as a result, I add value to myself that would be valuable to you. In other words, I do lots of things. I wear what I call them. I describe them lots of masks. I have lots of talents that I have accrued over the years, stuff that I've learned to do that people needed or, or something, something that I felt like if I do this, if I become this, if I have this skill, if I have this knowledge, then I become valuable. It's why I read so many books every year as well. And once I learned that was my motivation, like holy cow, I like eased back on my book reading schedule. Like holy cow, I can, you know, I can, I can read 35 books instead of 50 or 70 or more and more every year. Like I can, I can read just a, a lower number of books because I don't have to I don't have to have all this stuff. I don't have to be armed with all that. But, but, but that desire to look, be viewed as competent, to be viewed as helpful, to be viewed as, uh, as worth or valuable to somebody caused me to act in so many ways to gain all these skills. And, and it ultimately put me in a position of a very codependent behavior where we call rescuing. Like I'm constantly in a state of rescuing somebody because I have all these skills and I can help in all these ways. And it can show up in a form of people pleasing because I want to be affirmed. I want to distinguish myself from others. I want to have attention. I want to be admired and I want to 
And ultimately what that does, this greatest fear in my life, when you start whittling it down, and it took me some time to learn this about myself, guys, just being honest, but once I discovered my greatest fear, I learned that that greatest fear lends itself to uh, me, uh, me giving control over my life to man to, to, and, and trying to control it myself, not God. Seeking to please everyone else around me instead of seeking to please an audience of one. And that's my heavenly father. This is off base and it's sinful at its heart. This was my greatest fear. Control ultimately became my behavior and I learned to fear what I couldn't control because if I couldn't control how you viewed me, if I couldn't control uh, how I was able to help, if I couldn't control everything around me, then I couldn't be valued. And God walked me through a process where I learned to submit, where I learned that I need to trust God with control because really, I'm, I can't control anything. I can't control tomorrow. I can control my 20 square feet. That's it. I can control myself. I can't control you. I can't control whether you'll value me, love me, choose to be with me. I can't control any of that. And I need to stop spending so much of my energy trying to earn your value and earn that. That's a, this was a very freeing process, a process that he took me through to learn to trust him. And I'm not perfect at it, but I'm very, very aware of my own heart's desire to please you, to please others around me, to wear the masks, to expend my energy that way. You're like, Aaron, I'm really uncomfortable with your level of honesty. This is what you get with me. I'm just being honest, that I'm learning to trust God. In this pandemic, having learned that, that that's one of my greatest needs and, and one of, that, that one of my greatest sins or my greatest fear is to lose control has been very freeing because I've walked through this different than a lot of people because I'm like, I can't control this. Even if I did all the social distancing and, and, and did everything that I'm told to do and the self-quarantining, there's still no guarantee that I won't get coronavirus. I can't, I can't really control that. I can do my best here but I can't control it, and there was so much peace that came along with it. Even the environments that coronavirus has produced where, man, gathering together has become a thing that, that is, is frightening for a lot of people. In the church, the best response we can have is to go, hey, we're just gonna go online for the rest of the year. That's a choice we made. I was scared that it would upset a lot of you, but I, I had this peace in my heart that I didn't create this environment. I can't control this, and I can't control you if you choose to go, well, I think it's unfaithful to not meet in a church. And, and where we're going, I think it's the best thing we can do for our community right now is to not meet. It, it, it's, it's for a lot of reasons that I've already explained multiple times. But I didn't cause this environment. We're responding to it. And we're choosing the online environment, which also meant we were going to choose to let our lease lapse at the building we were in at 1055 McNaughton Road. We let it lapse. We moved out this past week and we, and we put everything in storage. And now we're just here in these studios. I'm trusting God. I'm choosing to trust in this, in this space. And, and I'll tell you the beauty of trusting God is that I'm trusting God. We move into the space. And as soon as we moved into our storage unit this past week, I get in my truck and I got a phone call about an opportunity for a building. Now I have no idea if that building will pan out or not. But this, I felt like it was God just affirming. Hey Aaron, you, you, you're, you're getting there. You're trusting me more. You're trusting me more. And here's the thing, trust is better. Now, that's just me. I know I spent a lot of time talking about me. Let me move on to you. When you pray this prayer, God, search my heart, and then test me. Know my anxious ways. Know my anxious ways, and you let God's word begin to speak to those issues. Man, you'll learn to walk in faith and not fear. You'll learn to respond differently, to pursue that peace. Now, this is good stuff. But David didn't stop here. Check it out. David continued to pray. And the third thing he prayed in this prayer was, uncover my sins. So search my heart, reveal my fears, and uncover my sins. Man, that is a tough one. But he said, see if there's any offensive way in me. Oof. We already know that if our hearts are wicked, that there are ways of ours that are wicked, that there are ways that are offensive. And David is praying this prayer and opening himself up to God saying, is there anything in my life that doesn't align with your word? Is there anything in my life that doesn't align with your will for me? Is there anything in my life that doesn't ultimately align with your best for me? 
anyway. And that means his attitude, the way that he talks, how he talks about things, who he talks about, how he talks about people, uh, his thoughts, his decisions, his finances, his marriage, his parenting, his sexuality, all of it, his relationships, all of it. Is there any way in me? Any means any. It means all of it. It's, it's all. Any way in me. There's a way that I'm handling stuff, stewarding what you've given me that, that isn't in alignment with what you have for me. That's a powerful prayer. This is a dangerous prayer. Because I think it's easy for us to see the sin in other people's lives. Like, I mean, I can tell you all of your issues and not see my own. Jesus spoke to this, right? We're really good at doing that. But Jesus said, why are you worried about the speck of dust in somebody else's eye when you've got a plank, right? So a piece of sawdust in someone else's eye, you've got a plank, a whole board, a two by four, sticking out of your own eye. It's like, like, just stop that mess. Like, it's easy for us to see the speck of dust and not a plank that's in our eye. I don't know why that is, but this is a prayer, again, for awareness. It's, it's asking, and it requires humility for you to even pray this prayer, to have it revealed any way in me that is offensive, God. Because what this does is it gives God permission to point it out. And so let me help you with three questions. Three questions I think that, that if you begin asking yourself, it will help lead you to, other, to awareness of your sinfulness along with you praying this prayer. And the first question is, is, what are others trying to tell me? What are the things people have been telling you about in, in your life? Maybe issues or concerns that they've brought to you and said, you know what, I, I think I see this in you and I'm not sure. It's probably one that's been repeated to you multiple times, maybe even just, just once or twice. But if it's been spoken to you, like, Maybe this is an issue. Maybe that's it. What are others trying to tell you? I'm, my wife told me this past week, Aaron, I'm afraid to have conf confrontational conversations with you sometimes. And I said, what? That's stupid. I don't understand. I'm so approachable. People love talking to me. What do you mean? That hurts my feelings that you would say that. How could you possibly say that? And then I was just demonstrating exactly what she said. That sometimes it's hard for me to bring confrontational things to you. That was a confrontational thing. And my response was terrible. And she looked at me and she said, and it's responses like these. This is why I don't like it. I was not very approachable after all. I was not aware of my own issue that resided in my heart. And she proved her point. So what are others trying to tell me? So you can key in on stuff like that. When people are telling you, there's a reason that they're telling you and it's, Almost always, especially if this person loves you, right? Like if you know this person loves you. I'm not saying you need to take this from everybody, but people that you know love you. What are they trying to tell you? And the next question is, what have I rationalized for some time now? What kind of stuff have you justified in your life or you decided to let slip by the way because, well, it makes sense to do this or I'm just being helpful or there's, there's a check in your heart that you've ignored it. Like, what about you? What is it for you that you are rationalizing away? The third question is this, where am I most defensive? You've already kind of heard some of mine. I, 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 confrontation is a, clearly, there's, there is a, some, something broken inside of me that if I feel attacked, I just respond poorly. Now, the good news is, is that I'm aware of this, and the good news is, is that even if I respond poorly, I'm very sensitive to a lack of peace in my life. I'm also very sensitive to how I'm feeling now. And, and I will come back and I'll apologize, which I most certainly did. And, uh, and my wife and I are good, by the way, just in case you were worried. It just happened this past week. But what is it about, what is it for you? What is it you don't want to talk about? What is it you feel like you have to defend and why? What is it you would say to somebody, don't judge me? Or I don't have a problem with that. I know you think I do, but I don't have a problem with that. Or, or what is it some, something that some, an issue somebody would bring to you that you would just simply say, back off. Leave it alone. What, what is that in your life? Because I think these three questions will help you to unearth some of those issues to make you more aware. In addition, of course, to praying God search me and show me any offensive ways within me. And here's what I believe. If you have the courage to pray these kind of dangerous prayers, that God's going to point out some things to you. 
and he's going to speak to your heart, and he's going to send others along, along your path to help you see things that you just can't see yourself. And if you have the courage to deal with it, there is a pathway to actually dealing with it. In Scripture, in 1 John 1, 9, 1, 9, it says that if you confess your sins, because that's what this is, it's sinfulness, guys. It's the wickedness of our own hearts on displays, and sin is just missing the mark of God's best for your life. So when we live out our, our lives in ways that are, that are off, right, it's the sinfulness of our hearts, it is our fears, and it, it's the, uh, the attitudes that are there that, that we're asking God to like uncover, right? It's all that stuff. It's sin. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if, if we'll just confess those sins to God, he's faithful and just, even when we're not, to forgive us. That's beautiful. That means the weight of that sin is gone. We, we don't have to deal with it anymore. But it also requires repentance, that we have to systematically restructure our lives so that we can follow after Jesus and live out God's best for us in that area. When we discover that sinfulness and what that takes in order to do that is not just confessing to God, but it's confessing to others. You need to find someone else that you can confess that sin to and say, man, I really messed up in this area. And James 5.16 tells us, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another so that you can be healed. If you want to grow in this area, you need accountability and prayer. Because, man, prayer does some good stuff in you, man. God begins to act when somebody that is a Christ follower prays for you. So you confess this and say, man, I've got, I'm struggling in this area. And I've already dealt with it with God, and I'm repenting, and this is the way I'm going to change my behaviors. And now you've got accountability, man. That's what you need to be in a group. We have small groups here. We have our grow groups here at Simple Church. And they're already, they're going to launch the first week in, in September. September 6th, I believe, is the week that they'll start going. That's Labor Day weekend, right? That's the week of that, of Labor Day. Uh, but, but that's why you need to be in a group. Because when you get into our small groups, man, you find people that you can be honest with. Now, you don't have to be honest with everybody in that group, but you need to find someone in your life that you can be honest with, someone you can take the mask off with, somebody that you can just say, man, this, this is where I'm struggling. And you'll, I'm guarantee you what you're gonna find out is that if you're willing to be vulnerable with them, you're gonna find they've struggled with or are currently struggling in the same way. Just be honest. Share your sin. Share your path of repentance and get some accountability and watch as they pray with you and God begins to heal that area in your life. Get in a group. I'm running a group called a freedom group this semester. And man, I would encourage you, if you haven't settled your past yesterday and your yesterdays yet, wow, that was a weird sentence. If you haven't settled your yesterdays yet, join the freedom group. It's for men and women. It'll, it's gonna be a deep dive and I promise you it will be uncomfortable, but you'll find freedom. But there are plenty of other groups that are available. Get in a group. The topic is not near as important as you getting into a group and beginning to walk out the spiritual pathway. But when you pray this dangerous prayer of God, search me. Search me. This pathway is important. And, and here's what this pathway does. These first three things David prayed are important and powerful, but what they do is that they ultimately reveal our need for something that is beyond us. Because when we ask God to search our hearts, we find that it's wicked. When we ask God to reveal our fears, we find that we don't trust God uh, as well as we'd like. When we ask God to reveal any way that is offensive, our sins, man, we, we find out that in totality, there is a need that is represented here that is beyond our ability, and this almost feels too heavy, except that there's a fourth thing David prayed because praying these first three things leads us to pray this prayer. God, lead me. Lead me, David said this, and lead me in the way everlasting. See, there is a way that is everlasting, and it's Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And this danger, dangerous prayer that if you pray it on a regular basis will constantly reveal our need for Jesus, our need for us to come to him and say, Jesus, I need your grace today. Jesus, I need your mercy in this situation. Jesus, I need your forgiveness. I need your strength. I need you to transform my heart. Jesus, I need you to help me. 
That's a powerful prayer. Realizing our own depravity, realizing our own issues, and that we don't have what it takes to deal with them leads us to call out to Jesus. That may mean if you're, you're in a cycle of addiction right now that you understand asking Jesus for help means, means you praying that prayer means that he's gonna provide you a pathway to freedom and that you need to walk it out. If you've got pride issues, then, then what you need is some humility in your life and you need to learn to depend on him. If you've got lust issues in your life that, that he reveals to you when you pray this prayer, man, you're gonna need his truth to renew your mind and transform your heart. If you've got materialistic issues within, within you, you're gonna need to fall in love with Jesus, understanding that this is not your home, that we are aliens here, we are just passing through, that our home is actually in eternity and it's in heaven that the best thing we can do is lay up treasures there in heaven and not worry about treasures here on this earth, that there is no need for nice material things, that we can know joy and happiness and peace and love without stuff. What Jesus reveals in you when you pray this prayer, it may feel embarrassing to you. So how could I not have seen that? It may feel too heavy for you. Like this is too much. You mean I've been acting this way the whole time and I've been hurting people this way? It may feel too heavy and I understand it is too heavy. It's too heavy a burden for us. But that's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus gave his life. That's why Jesus paid the price. A price we couldn't pay for ourselves. He gave his life as a ransom for ours. And he did all of that so that you could be free from the burden of our sins, so that you could be made brand new, so that you could have a life that is transformed and changed, so that you could have a full and ultimately a fulfilled life here on earth and eternity with him in heaven. That's what he did. But having all that comes by following his ways, the way everlasting, not following our own ways. So when you pray this dangerous prayer, God, search me. Reveal my fears, uncover my sins, and lead me to follow your ways. It's ultimately, when you pray that, the result of it is gonna point you to Jesus. It's gonna reveal your need for him, and you're gonna need to lean into his power, into his grace, into his mercy, and his love, and the freedom that he offers. This dangerous prayer will transform your very life. So, here's my ending prayer. And I'm going to ask us all to pray it together, if you so dare. Here it is. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Father, my prayer today is that you would do this work in us. That you would lead us through this process of searching our hearts and uncovering all these things and reveal our need for you. Give us the courage to pray. Give us the patience to listen, the boldness to confess to you and to others whatever it is that you show us, and the grace we need to become more like Jesus. God, help us. Now, as I pray this prayer, stay, just remain in this posture for just a moment, quiet and still. If you're here today, and I say you're here, but if you're tuned in today, whether you're in our online campus or you're watching on YouTube or however you're tuned into this broadcast, and you would say, Aaron, I'm just like you. I'm sinful. I'm recognizing that I have a need for God. And, and that sin in my life, that weight is crushing. Uh, it's crushing, and what I desire most is, is freedom from it. What I desire most is what you're talking about today, is a relationship with God, an intimate relationship with God, to experience his goodness. Man, you can do that. You can have all that. God offers all of this through Jesus, his son. And if that sounds appealing today, know that it is. It is literally the best. You can experience forgiveness. You can experience God's grace, his mercy. You can experience his love. Because God loves you, man. God is not mad at you. I don't know who's told you that God is angry with you, but he's not. He loves you. The best part of his day is giving us do-overs. In fact, I was reading this morning in, 
in, in Lamentations. It's a, a book in the Old Testament. And it says that God's mercies are new every morning. Like you can't even exhaust them. There's nothing you've done in your life that has, can exhaust the mercy of God. That's how much he loves you. God is love. And he has a life that he's intended for you. It's a full life and a fulfilled life. And, and you can have it all. You can have eternity in heaven as well. If, if you'll accept Jesus as Lord of your life, commit to doing things his way, saying, God, search me. Praying this prayer. And you can have the great joy of knowing God. And if you're ready, it's your time. If you're in our online campus right now, there's a button that came up in the chat. It says, I'm raising my hand. I'm saying yes to Jesus. Click that button right now. Take the next steps to follow it. But do this first. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. Fill me with your spirit and show me how to live for you. Lead me in the way everlasting. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Man, I'm excited for those of you that prayed that prayer because I know that your spiritual journey is just beginning, but I know that there is a life that you could have never imagined for yourself that is on the other side of that prayer. So I'm proud of you. I'm celebrating with you. In fact, you probably see people in the comment section celebrating with you right now. We are so excited to be on this spiritual journey with you, and we want to help you. That's why the next step after you click that I raise my hand is to fill out a connection card. Filling out that connection card, the digital one, helps us get in touch with you to help you on your spiritual journey. Because guess what? You were never meant to do this alone. You're never meant to fumble through the dark or try to read the Bible on your own. We want to guide you through that so that you can know who Jesus is and then you can see God revealed all throughout his scripture. We want to be part of that journey. If you fill out that connection card, we can help you with that. So make sure you do that today. Amen, everybody? All right, well, a couple things we want to do before we wrap up our time today. First is if you came prepared to give of your tithes and offerings, which is anything above the tithe, thank you so much for your faithfulness in doing that. Uh, there are ways to do that here on this screen, uh, and uh, I appreciate you continuing to do that. A uh, couple things you need to know as we wrap things up today. I already mentioned it, but grow groups are ready. You can actually sign up for them now. They launched the, the, the September 6th that week, but you can sign up for them now. They are available there. Um, there may be additional ones added as we go along, but right now all that we are offering is up, and uh, you can register today. Uh, in fact, you've been able to register this whole week leading up to today's service. So uh, make sure that you do that. Get in a group. Don't wait because some groups will fill up. There are groups that will be offered uh, just digitally so that you can join them over Zoom. There are some groups that are in person and there are some groups that are, are offering both. So make sure that you pick uh, whichever group fits your needs during this season. Also, join a watch party, man. You can join a watch party where if, uh, again, unless you have concerns about your health during this time or the concerns of someone you love and you're in close proximity to them uh, and, if, and if you have those concerns then you are doing the right thing by watching online with just your family or by yourself um, but but if, if those are not concerns for you and you you're okay with either a wearing a mask and practicing social distancing and and gathering together at a watch party man join a watch party the fellowship that is happening uh, at our own watch party is just fantastic i love seeing people and connecting with them and worshiping with them together and watching the messages and discussing. Uh, it's just such a great time. So join a watch party. Get in a group as well. They're not the same thing. Watch parties are for Sunday services and worship together. Grow, uh, the grow groups are to grow intentionally together. So make sure you join one of those. This uh, today wraps up this series uh, called Dangerous Prayers. Next Sunday is a Vision Sunday where we're going to talk a little bit about where we've been for this year. We're going to refocus and talk about what we're going to do for the rest of the year. It is a great message. If you're traveling for uh, the holiday weekend, make sure you tune in and get, this, get the message that I'll share. Get it in your spirit. Get refocused. Get ready as we prepare uh, for the rest of the year. And then, man, a huge announcement that I really don't have a lot of the details on yet is that we are planning an in-person outdoor gathering at the end of September. More details to come soon for that, but we're gonna worship together, we're gonna do communion together, and we've missed baby uh, dedications this year. We're gonna do baby dedications on that night. We're gonna do baptisms for those of you that need to take that next step of faith in your spiritual journey of getting baptized. 
Uh, and, and then, of course, I'll give a special message as well, but it is going to be a night that is not to be missed. So uh, we will have a plan for proper social distancing, ways to indicate, like, hey, the, I'm, I'm ready to be hugged full on, or uh, that's not for me, no thank you. We'll have all kinds of ways visually to represent that, so you don't have to worry about telling anybody, hey, keep your distance, or hey, let's practice. Uh, I can talk to you, but from six feet away, or however that, you, you need that to show up in your life right now. We're ready to gather together with you and honor that together. Amen, everybody. So details are coming. We are super excited about that. Uh, so again, keep watching for the dates on that, times and location to be announced. And uh, we'll be excited to see you guys because I haven't seen us all together since March. So God bless you guys. I love you so much. We'll see you right back here next week for Vision Sunday.